welcome to New Life Church Centre. Uh, welcome as we gather online. This is our fifth week of meeting together like this. Can you believe five weeks already? And uh, we want to invite you this morning to, to join with us in a time of worship and as we come together in listening to God's word. This week we've been able to get the band together uh, to put together a song uh, for us to worship together with this morning and we've followed all the social distancing rules um, and each of us have been able to, to record the song in our own homes and put it together. It's not perfect um, but just enjoy, let's sing together, let's worship together, let's lift up the name of Jesus this morning in our own homes uh, before we come together and listen to God's word. this through the medium of modern technology and we thank God for the opportunity that we can still fellowship together uh, in this difficult time in which we find ourselves today. Uh, today I've asked uh, if Keith, who's a member of our church, would just share his thoughts and what the Lord, he feels the Lord is speaking and saying into his heart and into his life at this moment in time. He's a frontline worker, he's a BT engineer, he's out there keeping us all connected, so thank God for them all. 
and keeping us all connected in this time that we find ourselves isolated like we are. He's also part of our worship band and plays guitar for us as well. But knowing the Lord Jesus as his saviour for a good many years, he's in a good position to be able to share what Christ means to him at this moment in time. So let us just sit back and just listen to what Keith has to say to us this morning. He recorded this, I believe, when on a break while at work at that particular time. So let, as I said, let's just sit back and just listen to what he has to say to us today. Let our hearts be open and receptive and to what the Holy Spirit might want to say to us. And are we hungry and thirsty for what the Holy Spirit might reveal to us today? So let's be receptive. Amen. Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining me today. I want to thank you, all the, all the tech team that we've got, basically Alan and uh, Rachel, for helping uh, to facilitate this. And uh, thank you, Pastor, for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, the word I'm going to bring to you this morning uh, basically was birthed in me or originated from the, the 2020 Vision Prayer Meeting that we had r right back in the good old days of January this year when the world seemed fairly normal. Um, we were praying for the, the, for the coming year, for the, the future for the church, for all the various things that we put on at church, and I um, well, just wanted God to guide us and lead us. Little did we know then what we'd be facing just two or three months later. But, well, we're here now, that's the situation. But while we were praying um, back in January, I remember, I remember asking God, if there's a, a word or a specific thing that he um, that he was talking to me about, something that he wanted me to pray about, or, and, or something to even to, to share with people to, to tell uh, tell them what he was saying, uh, and I felt that the Holy Spirit just challenged me, basically with the words, "Are you hungry for this?" And it did stop me in my tracks because I, I stopped and think, "Well, how hungry am I really?" Because I was. I'm praying, I'm really wanting revival. But I want, the, I want to see our little country church filled to the rafters with people coming in, giving their lives to God, living for God, being healed, being set free. I, I want to see yeah, well, just the joy of the Lord filling those people and filling that place. But then, like I say, the Holy Spirit challenged me with, are you hungry for it? And it, it did make me stop and think, how hungry am I really for what God is saying? And then um, when I went home that evening and I, I started thinking about hunger, looking through the, uh, through the Word, through the Bible, um, where hunger was mentioned, and there's a lot of it in the Bible, I must admit. Um, but it made me think that the hu hunger is actually a, a in the natural as in earthly or humanly or whatever. Hunger is natural and it, it is actually a good thing. I know it can go to the extremes and it, it isn't a good thing, but hunger basically drives you to do things. If you think about the animal kingdom, think about um, early man, you know, cavemen, if they didn't feel that hunger, that, that desire, that drive, they would never gone off and studied hunting or, you know, or picking berries and or then uh, cultivating um, you know, crops, um, looking after animals, as, you know, herding animals together, to, you know, so they've got a supply of food. So it's the, hunger is the driving force behind all of that, really. And, well, I'm, the way it is at the moment with, uh, with this situation, with the COVID-19 and the shutdown and all that, I recognise that this message now isn't just going to be delivered at or for New Life Church Centre for our, you know, our lovely folk there. But I'm, I'm possibly there's two different um, uh, audiences, if you like, here. There are those from the church, there may be others that, that I know about or who know of me that have clicked on this link because they know me from, previous, from a previous church or people like that, or maybe people who wouldn't wouldn't even class themselves as believers, Christians, followers of followers of Jesus, or whatever. so I I, I recognise the fact that 
I might be speaking to two different audiences here. Um, but the message is the same. Whether you're a believer in Jesus or you're not a believer in Jesus, you're not a Christian, you're not saved, as we say, you still feel hunger. And I'm not just talking about the physical hunger that people you know, suffer, you know, want, wanting food, wanting, you know, thirst for drink and things like that. But you, well, all your life, you'll have had desires to do things. You know, you wanted to boyfriend, girlfriend, that sort of thing. And there's, uh, or um, you want to get on in, get a, a better job, uh, more money, which comes from better jobs, I suppose. Um, or even you want to, I know you want to own something, or that there's something has driven you through your life, and it's motivated you. Um, so it is a good thing to be hungry, to, um, to if, if it, can, it will motivate you, if it will drive you into doing something um, that will improve, because basically you want to improve things, you want to improve your life, you want to improve your health, all these things are driven by it. Like I said, it can go to the extremes though. And your hunger uh, or your, um, you know, your desire for things, it, it, if it goes too far, I mean, if you're hungry for, like, you want more possessions, you might then go too far and it will lead you into the, down the road of sin, as in stealing things. Um, you, know, you, you, you desire something so much, you'll do anything to get it. And that anything that you do might not be good. It could be a, a bad thing that you do. Um, Proverbs 16, verse 26 says, A labourer's appetite makes him work harder because he wants to satisfy his hunger. That's exactly just what I've been saying. It's, you know, it, it, the Bible isn't always difficult, folks. It's, it says it there, A labourer's appetite makes him work harder because he wants to satisfy his hunger. True? I think so. So that's hunger for, th for physical things. Now to the believers, my brothers and sisters, I'm saying, do you have a hunger for the things of God? Like I was saying in that prayer meeting, I, God challenged me with, are you hungry for revival? Because that is what has been in my heart for the last few years really, that not just our own little church, but churches throughout the country. I want to see this, um, this nation uh, go through a revival that we've not seen for probably over 100 years. We've got the Welsh revival, I think, was the last big one that, uh, that hit our nation or that, that God blessed this nation with. Um, and in those days, I've, I've read about it, um, I think police stations were closing down because there was no crime, because there were so many people living their lives for Christ, how, living how they should, should be living, what they how they were created to live, um, they, then there's just no need for crime. There's um, and just oh, it just it, it sounds like a utopian uh, society, really. But it can be like that again. When when God's in control, when God is leading the people, it's fantastic. And that's what we that's what I've been I've been praying for, been looking for for the last few years, and I believe is coming. But God was telling me how hungry are you? And I th I thought I was very hungry for that, but it's challenged me. Because if I'm hungry, what am I doing about it? Not just hoping for it, not even just praying about it. Am I going out and telling people about this? Am I sharing my faith with other people? And thank God I, I do have opportunities to uh, occasionally. And I, I must admit, I'll be honest, I don't always take those opportunities. I, I wish I did. I walk away some, after some conversations and think, Oh God, I've let that you know I've let that person down, and I've let you down, and all I can do then is, is pray that God will still move in that person's heart. But um, it, it it can be a challenge. Psalm sixty three verse one says, "O oh God, you are my God, and I long for you. My whole being desires to like uh, desires you, like a worn out and waterless place, and my soul is thirsty for you." And Psalm 42, verse 1, As a deer pants or longs for a stream of cool water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for you, the living God. Where can I go and worship in your presence? 
am I like that? Always or ever? I'd, sometimes, I must admit, yes. I, I, I just, I don't want anything else in the world just to be in the presence of God. And I, but I want to be like that more. And I think God is challenging all of us, really. Do we want to spend more of our time with God or do we want to, what comes down to, do we want to watch more television? Do we want to go and, you know, we can't socialise at the moment, but will we go and do that or will we just find other things to do to, to try and satisfy our, our desire for doing things? Do we, you know, do we um, just want to fill our time, just want to pass the time by, by messing about with really trivial things? I, I play games on my, uh, my iPad quite a lot at home while I'm watching the television. And I, sometimes I, I stop and think, what a waste of time. I've just spent an hour, two hours playing a trivial little game. What, what is that? How, how is that? That hasn't satisfied me in the slightest. It's like when you're, you're hungry and you're having, you're, just, you're having a snack, you know, you're just eating a couple of peanuts or you know, having a chocolate bar. It, it, it might feel nice at the time, or it, but, but afterwards it doesn't, it doesn't truly satisfy you. But it also, it can ruin your appetite. Like, you know, you're having a chocolate bar, you don't want your dinner a couple of hours later. Um, well, not many. When you're younger, you can, mate. But when you get older, you don't feel like it. But um, filling your time with the wrong things will, can ruin your appetite for God. Um, if you, but if you go for the good stuff, you know, if you allow that hunger to move you towards something really satisfying. And the only thing that really satisfies in life, speaking to the believers and non-believers that may be watching this, the only thing that truly satisfies is life with Jesus, with Christ, with, with God, with spending time with him. I know it might be a, like, I feel like an alien concept to, uh, to non-believers who might be watching, but Oh, it's hard to describe really how satisfying, just that sensation of knowing that God is with you. I've had, certain, I've had like um, experiences of God at certain times throughout my life. I've been a Christian for just over 30 years now. And there's been many times at that time where I've just felt God overwhelming me. Um, it, it might sound strange, you might think I'm a bit of a weirdo, but although my, my Christian brothers and sisters on here that are watching this, they will, hopefully, they will have recon they recognise, they'll understand, and they will have experienced the same things. There's times where I've just had to shout hallelujah because there's something, God is so real and so present that you just have to you know, express it one way or another. You have to say hallelujah. I've even danced, I'm at me. I've danced, can you believe it? On my own in a room on my own, but I just felt so overwhelmed with the joy of knowing what God has done. And there's other times where, I mean, even yesterday morning, I watched a, a video on my phone of someone singing um, Amazing Grace, a song I've heard hundreds and hundreds of times. I've sang it myself loads of times. And I sat, I was in my van at, at work, and I just sat and bawled my eyes out. It just overwhelmed me, this grace of God that has forgiven us of all our sins and allowed us into uh, his, his kingdom, in, into his presence. <clears throat> so how often, Christians, how often do you ask God to fill you? You know, in, uh, in Acts 2, you know, the Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given, and it, it overflowed, well, it, it came as tongues of fire to the believers that were gathered in that upper room, and then it overflowed from them into the world around them. They, they preached, three, I think it was 3,000 people were saved on, in, in that first sermon. Just the overwhelming exuberance of God through the Holy Spirit. But do you know that we can have that too? We can be overwhelmed, we can be flooded with the Holy Spirit and it can flow from us and through us. I've, I've ex experienced that myself a few times as well, like I was saying earlier. But. Um, we need to keep asking God to fill us. We need to, um, well, as we give out, we know we receive from God. We know that, um, well, the 23rd Psalm, 
you know, um, oh, I've got it written down somewhere, bear with me. I should know it. Where is it? There you go. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. The bit I want to get to is, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup is overflowing. It overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. But that bit there, my cup overflows. Is your cup, is your cup overflowing? Are you um, asking God to fill you, to overflow you with his goodness, with his Holy Spirit? Because that is the secret. Well, not even a secret. That is the, the essence of what the Christian life is. It's overflowing with the Holy Spirit. It's the love of God that fills us with that spirit. Um, let me just go back to the notes on here. I found this quote. Um, God, I must admit, I've never heard of him before. Is an American author called John Piper. He's still living, apparently. Uh, but he once said, if you don't feel a strong desire for the manifestation of the glory of God, it's not because you are drunk deeply and are satisfied, but it is because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world, your soul is stuffed with small things, and there is no room for the great. That's what I was saying earlier about nibbling on a chocolate bar before your lunch. It spoils your appetite for your lunch, so don't have the chocolate bar. Have the lunch. The lunch I'm saying is, God, don't go for other things. Just God is the, the making the, the main thing you want, you desire. Um, I, 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 must admit, I added this little bit. How often do we ask God to give us things to fill us up? Oh, sorry, not that bit. Um, I added this bit. Don't ruin your appetite. Allow the hunger in you to grow, to urge you to the word of God, the presence of God, the will of God, and the work of God. The work of God. That's what I'm talking about with the um, wanting revival. Don't just want revival. Don't just hope for revival. Don't even just pray for it. Well, yeah. Pray for it, but don't just pray for revival. Plan for revival. Think um, what you can do to bring about revival. I know things are difficult at the moment with this, uh, with the lockdown and conversations are difficult, but we're still online. We still have you know, social media. You, we have telephones still. I mean, I don't know, you, know, you know, my job is a telephone engineer, a broadband engineer. I'm trying to keep people connected. Use the telephone. I'm not... <laughs> It sounds like, an, uh, like I'm trying to sell it here, but use the telephone, speak to people, have a chat with them, see how they're getting on, what, ask them about their fears, and tell them the joy that you have, the, the comfort you have, knowing that God is in control. Even in all this, this COVID-19, this worldwide shutdown, hasn't surprised God. It hasn't took him off guard, like, oh, oh what's going on here? No, God knew about this from the foundation of the earth. From the, the time he created, he knew this would happen. And he knows what's going to happen afterwards, or where, this all, where all this is leading to. John G. Lake, who was an American Pentecostal leader from the turn of the, 20, not the 29th century, the 20th century, um, Actually, the big revival, uh, the turn of the, the 20th century, and he was part of it, he's a Pentecostal leader. He said the most powerful prayer a Christian can pray is, God, make me hungry for you. I know all throughout the Bible, people, well, and us ourselves, we've, uh, we'll pray, oh God, give me, God, give me, fill me, give me this, give me that, give me, I want this, can you give me this? Would you be brave enough to pray, God, make me hungry? Give me a hunger. It's not a, a nice thing to ask for, really. Normally, you're asking to be filled and satisfied, not asking to be made empty and hungry. Because when we're empty and hungry, it, like I said from the very beginning of this, uh, this sermon, when we're hungry, that will motivate us. Oh, God, that, that you would motivate us to, to do your will. 
That's what we really want. And for those um, non-Christian, non-believers, I don't want to give you labels, but those who haven't put their faith in Christ, who wouldn't identify as being a Christian because of faith. I don't mean you've grown up in a Christian nation or you, even that you were baptised as a or Christian as a child. That doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is hearing the gospel and responding to the gospel. And responding to the gospel means that your life will change for the better. It's not, I will now start um, living the Ten Commandments. It's not like, oh, well, I'll, I'm going to have to stop doing this and stop doing that. That is not what being a Christian is. It's a, it's, there's a part of it in there, I must admit, there's a, but mainly because you don't want to do those things. Like I was saying about the hunger, you, you won't really hunger for those things as much. I'm not saying it goes completely, but you won't hunger for um, the bad, thing, bad parts of life, shall we say. But if you put your trust in, uh, in Christ uh, by believing the, um, the gospel, you might not even know what the gospel is. I, I'm aware, actually, I was going to say before I started this, that uh, you know, in, in my job we use a lot of jargon. There's a lot of acronyms and you know, all these sorts of things which we can talk to each other about at work and we, you know, people listening wouldn't have a clue what we were saying. And sometimes, I know we as Christians do that, we, we talk about it's, you know, certain words and stuff and people on the outside might be, well, I don't really know what you're on about. The Gospel is simple. We have all sinned. We, have, we were born in sin. We, um, we've fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 5, 8, I think. So that, um, for we've all fallen short of the glory of God. That means that we haven't reached the stand, like God's standard. You, you show me anybody who has lived a life absolutely perfectly. And there's only one. And you know that. That's, that's Jesus Christ. And yet... He died. He was killed. Now, the Bible, the God's word, his, uh, his instruction manual to the world tells us that um, sin has a punishment. It has a consequence. And sin, the consequence of sin is death. It, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a law written in, well, more, not even in stone, it's written in the universe that sin leads to death. Uh, blood must be spilled there must be a death to pay for sin um, so we should all die for our sins I don't know about you I sinned I'm presuming you've sinned and because of that we all deserve to die but there's only so we would have to die for our own sins the only way that could be broken was if somebody who was without sin would become sin and die. Now, it's a historical fact that Jesus Christ lived in uh, first century um, Palestine. There was a man called Jesus Christ. He lived, he taught, he was a, a leader amongst men down, uh, in that time. And he was crucified by the Romans and he, he died. That's a historical fact. We know as Christians that he actually rose again. We just celebrated Easter last week. We know that he, Jesus died on Friday, but on Sunday, stone was rolled, around, rolled away from the, the tomb that he was laid in, and he rose again. That shows us that God accepted Jesus' blood, Jesus' um, his death. He accepted that as payment for the sins of the world. If you've only got to look at the most, what I think is the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the gospel, ladies and gents. It's quite simple. You, you believe it, and it does say that you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you'll be saved. It's kind of a, a little personal um, testimony, my my own conversion to Christianity. If like, I, I grew up. I was I went to church as a kid because I was in the boys' brigade. Uh, didn't understand 
much of it. I didn't really listen to most of it, to be honest. I was normally messing around at the back with my mates. And as soon as I didn't have to go to church anymore, when I, I think I turned 11, Mum said, it's up to you if you want to carry on with the boys' brigade or not. But I went, oh, right, no. And then I spent, the, from then 11 till I think I was 20, sort of agnostic, which means I don't know one way or the other. I'd like to believe, but I don't really know. And then, well, around about 1920, I started going totally the opposite way, which was basically I was looking into spiritualism. Yeah, you know, I, I wanted I wanted this to be life after death because I couldn't think of just dying and there being nothing. So I, I wanted to believe in spiritualism. The thing with spiritualism, there was yeah, there's life after death, but there's no judgment. There's no no real God. There's no heaven or hell. There's just another lot, another life after this life. And I like that. I like the sound of that. No judgment because I, you know, I knew I wasn't. I knew I'd done, I'd done lots of things wrong. So I started getting into, well, looking into spiritualism and stuff and uh, meditation and all these sorts of things. And I actually found myself confessing to being basically an atheist. I remember I went to, uh, my sister was confirmed, because um, she was going to get married, so she had to go to church for a year and she ended up going to confirmation classes and we went to a, a ceremony for her confirmation. I remember sitting in a um, this big old stone church in Tamworth in Arden I looked round and I actually said, God doesn't exist. This is just a building. God doesn't exist. And in, it's, it, sort of, it stopped me fighting in a way uh, with myself. It's just, I accepted that, great, I'm, a, I'm an atheist. Anyway, long story short, I got then suffered with depression and all sorts of things like that. Um, and then later on, I met my now wife, Stacey, we went to, uh, uh, well, we got out together. She was um, a lapsed Christian, so we say. And we, um, well, she wanted to go and see this, uh, this evangelist, this woman, and she said, could I, I, she couldn't drive at the time, so she said, would you take me? I went, oh, yeah, OK, I'll go for there for an experience. And basically, I went in to have a laugh at him. Uh, I, I went there, and I, I couldn't believe what I'd seen. Um, I was very sceptical. People were supposedly getting healed. I believe now that they were. At the time, I was, nah, that wasn't happening. Don't, didn't believe it for the slightest. Anyway, went through this whole meeting, and then he gave um, he gave an opportunity, this, uh, this preacher. Do you want to put your trust in Jesus Christ? Do you want to have Jesus Christ as your saviour? Because you need him. You need a saviour. And I was absolutely fuming inside. I was so angry that this man was calling me a sinner and this man was telling me I need to have Jesus in my life. And I was absolutely fuming. Anyway, basically stormed out of there. But it started me thinking, well, is there any truth? There's a, there was hundreds of people in that, uh, in that auditorium. And they all seemed, I seemed to be the only one who didn't know what this party was about. They all enjoyed themselves. And I, seemed, I felt I was the only one who didn't know what was happening. Anyway. I spoke to my uh, my girlfriend, now my wife, and quite a lot over the next few weeks, she was telling me things, and I went, well, I, I don't get it, I don't, I really don't understand it. How do I believe what I can't see? How do I believe what I, I haven't experienced? I can't believe something that, it, you know, I've not touched or smelt or, or, or felt or saw or heard. But it got to the point I felt like a battle going on inside, but I, my point is, is I got to the point where I was sat on the end of my bed at quarter past one on Friday the 17th of November 1989. That's quarter past one in the afternoon. I was home for lunch from the, the job I had at the time. And um, I'd got a, a leaflet that I'd, I'd found that was basically um, how, how to know God, how to... You know, it was someone's testimony of how their life was awful, but then they gave their life to, to Jesus. And so on the back of this leaflet, there was a prayer. And I, I read through it quietly first, you know, just in, in my head, just reading. Mm -hmm. And I looked up to God, well, I looked up to my ceiling of my bedroom, and I said to right, God, I'll give you one chance. If this is true, if this is real, I'm going to say this prayer and I want you to change me. I want, I want what all these other people who seem to have had that I've, that I've met at that meeting, and my, my girlfriend as well. She seemed different. I, I wanted, yeah, I want this extra bit in my life. I want it, Lord. 
And I read, I read through this prayer and I sat there and I waited for the crash of thunder and the flash of light and, the, and absolutely nothing. I didn't experience a thing at that time. But then I had to go back to work. So I was walking back to work, it took me 15 minutes and I was walking down the road and I suddenly, it sounds daft, but I suddenly realised I was whistling to myself. This is a man who was suffering with depression at the time. And I was suddenly whistling to myself and I was sort of bouncing, I had a bounce in my step and I suddenly stopped and I thought, what's going on here? And then in my, in my head, I remember, the, I remember the thoughts I had even now, 30, over 30 years later, the words in my head were, I don't know what I've done, but it's good and it's for the rest of my life. And just then this, what grew in me then was hope. There was a light, bear in mind I was depressed and I suddenly saw hope. At the end of this dark tunnel there was a light and I was heading, wasn't dying, I'd got this light I was heading towards. And that was the start of my walk with, with Jesus, my, my Christian life, however you want to, uh, whatever terms you want to use. And I invite you to do the same. Give God a chance. You've got hunger. You're hungry for something. Mate, that hunger really is hunger for God in your life. You don't, might not even realise, you might not know it, but you need God, you need Jesus in your life. So I invite you just to stop. You've got all this time now with people are self-isolated and the world is sort of shut down. Spend some of that time, just talk to God. Don't feel silly about it, he does hear you. Just say, God, I want to know more about you, I want to know you. If you've got a Bible, read, read bits from the Bible, read the, you know, the book of Acts, read John, read about the life of Jesus. It's all true. I can tell you 30 years later, I'm still living it, I'm still believing it, it still is changing me daily. So I invite you just to put your trust in Jesus Christ and believers that have already done that, ask God for the a hunger to have more of God, because you, you can't have too much of God. You can always have more. You can get, have a bucket and go to the ocean and fill that bucket. There's still that amount of God left. There's still an ocean of God left. And you can know him. And you can know him more. You can get, always get closer to him. So, and I've waffled on, but thank you so much for listening to this, um, this little talk this morning. Have a lovely day. God bless you and take care. Well, we thank you, Keith, for sharing the word of God with us this morning and the challenge you feel in your own heart, but also uh, out of what you've proven in your own life, the Lord to be so real uh, in your life and daily life as a frontline worker as well. You see, we have hunger for many things in life, but what we need to do is to have a hunger for God's word this is what will satisfy the longing of all of our hearts and our lives. The scripture tells itself clearly, if we hunger and thirst after righteousness or that that is right, we shall be filled or our need will be met. So let's take an opportunity while we have time on our hands to, to uh, take time to set aside, to read God's word, to talk to the Lord in prayer. For he is the one that will satisfy the longing of our souls. We hunger for so many probably different things in life but he's the one that will always satisfy. I've proved it to be true uh, all those years in my own particular life. And we thank Keith for sharing his heart with us today and, uh, and, and what the Lord Jesus means to him. So let us pray, shall we? Let's just bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the word of God and the challenge of the word of God that we've heard this morning. We thank you for Keith and his honesty in sharing that with us. And Lord, we, you want us to be hungry for you. And you said in your word so clearly, if we hunger and thirst after that that is right or that that is righteous, we shall be filled or our needs will be met. And so, Lord, create a greater hunger in all of our hearts and our lives. And Lord, if we do not know you as our Lord and Saviour, we don't understand these things. And just pray as we look at your word and read your word and read what the gospel said and what you said in the book of Acts 2, as we look at those things and read those things and we receive the challenge that it brings to us, 
that Lord you'll cause us to respond and as we respond out of an honest heart you will meet us Lord and we'll know what it is to find you as Lord and Saviour of our life so have your way in all of our lives continue to lead us and guide us and direct us we thank you for those frontline workers in our hospitals and throughout our country and our nations that are serving you uh, in this capacity of bringing healing in a very dire situation uh, that is, 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 is striking our nation at this moment in time. We just pray for your protection and Lord, your guidance and leading in the whole matter uh, of our nation, Lord, right from the uh, leadership of our Prime Minister right down through uh, the health workers and the care workers in the hospitals, nursing homes and throughout our nation those frontline workers that are keeping our nation going. So Lord, we thank you for that too. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and enjoy the rest of the day today. And remember what the scripture says, if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we shall be filled. God bless you all.